Hi, I'm Ken McLeod. I'm reading from my forthcoming novella, Selkie Summer, which is going to be published in a couple of months from Newcon Press. And I'm reading a couple of extracts from chapter one. For no reason I could see, the bus stopped. I peered through the rain-smeared, steamed-up window at a rocky, gloomy, treeless glen. Its sparse grass and heather couldn't tempt so much as a black-faced sheep. Beside a nearby bog, a rusty Scottish tourist board sign of crossed broadswords marked the Battle of Glen Whatever, way back in 17 forget it. Ahead, around a bend in the road, was a bridge. The bridge was in spate, but well below road level. What's the problem, someone called. Water horse, said the driver. A kelpie, cried an American passenger. Wow, can we get out? Like, to film it? No, said the driver. There was a clunk as the door locked followed by a mutter of disappointment and a surge to my side of the bus. Phones were pressed to all the windows, including one quite rudely over my shoulder. I shrugged the overbearing arm aside and wiped the inside of the window with my sleeve, tilting my face and phone to a view of where the burn gushed from a gully halfway up the hillside. At first, It seemed nothing but one of the many small waterfalls and rapids on that eroded slope. Suddenly the water rose, brown and white, shouldering itself above the cleft in which it ran. The long, roan head formed first, a black-eyed gleam, the white spume of the mane, and then the forelegs trampled air as the kelpie reared. Everyone, all the visitors anyway, gasped to a staccato of shutter sounds. The kelpie waited, gathering water and strength. Then down it plunged, its speed and balance impossible, its gait a perfect gallop, tail and mane flying out behind it, boulders and bushes flung from its path. It overlapped and fluttered across the bridge, dislodging one or two stones from the parapet. The water drained from the road. After a minute, the driver got out and heaved the stones to the side. Passengers edged back to their seats. The engine started up. As we crossed the bridge, we gazed down the water course, but the kelpie was long out of sight and by now probably prancing in the sea. The bus lurched over a lip of the glen and sped across a boggy moor. Civilization hove into view as a huddle of houses, a clump of rowans and a distant shaggy cow, and with them 4G coverage again at last. I took my phone from the bag on my knees and tapped maps. Twenty miles to go. Like most of the other non-locals on the bus, I took the opportunity to share my disappointingly bloody Kelpie pics. Likes pinged in. The view opened out to a two-lane highway along a grassy plain between two ridges of hills. Ahead, through the arcs of the wipers, I could see a brighter sky and a glimmer of sea. Beyond it rose the craggy skyline of the Isle of Skye, a fainter grey against the clouds. You'd think there'd be a bridge over the sea to sky. There isn't. Whenever the project is mooted, some wise woman or aged seer or upstart wild-haired young prophet rouses themselves from Cranog or Bothan or Sea Cave and hurries by bus and ferry and bus or train to the Scottish Parliament at Holyrood and has a word. Shortly afterwards, the Sky Bridge proposal disintegrates in a flurry of withdrawn green papers and hasty disavowals of ever having been on the committee. So, there's still a car ferry across the narrow channel between Kailakin and Kyle of Ralsh. It's the rustic mystics who do the talking, but it's the Selkies that everybody blames. 
Selkies are as set against sea bridges as Kelpies are against hydroelectric dams. There were grand schemes for Scottish hydroelectricity once. Back in the 1940s, the foundations for some dams were laid. You can see their ruins in the glens. In the highlands and islands, the electricity supply system is still called the nuclear. The Kailakan Ferry's rusty jointed steel ramp angled down, like fingertips unfolding in a flourish from the wrist, and banged on the slipway. A crewman jumped from ferry to pier and made fast a rope at two bollards. The eight cars on board bumped off one by one. Eight cars were waved on board one by one. Then the guy on deck beckoned the foot passengers. We crowded on either side into gangways that had a cover along the top. Glass windows to the sea, open to the deck. Shelter depended on which way the wind was blowing. I'd picked the unlucky, unlucky side. I turned my back to the wind and gazed out at the sea. The ramp clanged up and curved over. The engine note shifted. The ferry backed away from the quay and swung around. A rain blurred the window. I turned around to the deck. A tall young man in a blue jumper and jeans was going from car to car, taking fares. He had curly black hair that blew about in the wind. That was the first thing I noticed. The second was the way he moved. There was nothing flashy about it, no dancer's step. Just a sure foot on the wet deck. And unlike everyone else on board, including the other crewman I'd seen, he didn't notice the rain. I don't mean he ignored it. That would have implied some effort. He just didn't notice it. He noticed me. He straightened up from a roll-down window where he'd just stooped to take a fare and looked straight at me across the car roof at a distance of a couple of metres. He had very blue eyes and a handsome, slightly brown face. I felt something like an electric shock. I must have blinked. He smiled, a flash of white teeth. He turned and moved to the next car and didn't look back. I stopped staring after him and moved further in and found myself in front of a big laminated poster giving the company's conditions of passage. To distract myself from whatever was still making my knees shake, I read it. It listed all the misadventures for which the company took no responsibility in any circumstances. Among these were delay, loss of luggage, theft of luggage by the company's servants, arrival at a different destination to that advertised on the manifest, injury or loss of life, attack by Barbary pirates, sale of cargo or luggage to Barbary pirates, sale of passengers to Barbary pirates, war, conventional, war, nuclear, travel through radioactive fallout, diversion to avoid radioactive fallout, terrorism, counter-terrorism, asteroid impact, orders from established governments or their civil and military servants, actions or orders of strike committees, actions or orders of committees of workers, farmers, soldiers and intellectuals, loss or damage caused by whales or monsters of the deep. That sample by no means comprehensive is not exaggerated. You can look at the list yourself, if ever you travel on a ferry in the Western Isles. One thing is definitely not on it. Complete, sudden, inexplicable loss of heart to complete stranger. No, that's not on the list. I checked. Thank you.